This is the Caiaphas Ashuri. It once contained the bones of Caiaphas, the high priest. In the time of Jesus, he had the distinction of holding the highest, most sacred position in his culture. The ornate design of this box tells us this was a man of considerable wealth. Additionally, the Gospels tell us he was one of the primary individuals responsible for the murder of Jesus of Nazareth. Many of the world's religions have some sort of cleansing practice or concept of forgiving sins. Have you ever wondered why that is? Billions of people, all of whom on some level feel there's a part of them that's dirty, that needs to be cleaned. The first century Jewish culture Jesus was a part of was absolutely obsessed with ritual cleansing, the process by which a person would immerse themselves in a body of water to cleanse themselves of external impurities. This was extremely important, as being ritually unclean meant that one could not take part in the various religious festivals and services that were such a vital component of that culture. The most common method of cleansing would be to immerse yourself in the mikvah, a ritual bath. And since the need for cleansing was so constant, a mikvah could be found in many homes as well as in shared public spaces, such as this one in Jerusalem. This mikvah would have been very busy in Jesus' time, as it was located just outside the temple, and one could not approach this most holy site unless they were ritually clean. Typically, a person would undress, enter into the mikvah by a certain set of stairs, the dirty side, and fully immerse themselves in the waters of the mikvah re-emerging from a different set of stairs, the clean side. The circumstances that necessitated a person in Jesus' world to cleanse their bodies in this way were many. Menstruation, taking part in animal sacrifices, having a rash or certain skin conditions, touching a dead body, touching any animal that died naturally, sexual relations, the discharging of various bodily fluids, childbirth, or eating a meal with a Gentile. The list was very long. In addition to those many requirements, simply coming into contact with someone who was ritually unclean would then make you unclean as well. Today we don't really view each other in terms of our external cleanliness, but it's easy to take for granted just how important it is for us to feel and to be clean. And unfortunately, in this city, not everyone has that luxury. It's not one of those things we think about much, but for people in those situations, not having access to water, clean clothes, and basic hygiene dramatically affects how other people look at them and how they feel about themselves. We may not think about it much, but it's there in us we need to feel clean. So I headed up to the Bronx to spend time with a group that helps provide that for people. They're called Fusion Bilingual SDA Church, located in the South Bronx. And I spoke with Sandy Vasquez, their director for community service. We talked about the meaning behind the name Fusion. Firstly, it's because they were started by a group of young bilingual Hispanics. Like the South Bronx itself, they're a fusion of different languages and cultures. 
But there's another reason for the name Fusion. And then Fusion also because we fused with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, our churches, um, half of the members are community members that we have reached out to. And what does that mean, community members? Well, to us, is um, we're in the South Bronx, mm -hmm. and um, this generation decided to go outside and meet the community. And we started um, integrating the community into our church. So we're part community. And I got to experience that welcoming sense of community firsthand as they shared a delicious meal with me and the crew. Now, you just uh, treated us to an awesome meal earlier. <laughs> yeah. And um, you mentioned that the food that everyone eats here is the same food that you go and uh, share with the community. Exactly. Why for you is that important? Yes, because we want them to feel that we're sharing. It's not out of pity. It's, um, so it's a meal that we could sit together and break bread together. So the same thing that you ate, uh, the community members will be eating in a few. Life in the South Bronx isn't always easy, but they don't want to have pity on their community. They want to fuse with it, be a part of it. Yes, I think so. I think um, the fact that um, the community could identify with us because, you know, there's young, there's old, um, there's, you know, all eth ethnic groups. And, um, Which is very much a part of the Bronx. A part of the Bronx. Yeah, it's yeah. just what the Bronx is. Yeah. So that we're looking more and more like the community. And as they fused more with the South Bronx, they saw that there were those within their community who had a need for hygiene and cleanliness that wasn't being met. Well, we know that um, you know some of the members of our community don't have access to sometimes water and and um, and hygiene you know products. And we go out and we give them to them. We make little packages and you know we go to the homeless. You know that that is um, the group that needs it the most. And we bring all kinds of things that they could use, and they're very grateful they get a chance to clean up and move on. So they provide water, hygiene packages, and clean clothing to people who need them, even seeking out those who live in the detached recesses of their community to meet their needs. And the responses they get are of people appreciative to have that need in their lives met. We get some nice products for them. They get so happy. Dios lo bendiga. God bless you. How did you know we needed this? This is so cool. In the South Bronx, there are people who no longer feel clean, some of them living in the abandoned corners of their world. And then there are the people at Fusion Bilingual who look at them differently, who provide tools to help them start feeling better about themselves. And when those kinds of things happen, communities start to fuse together. The need to regularly cleanse our bodies is one we frequently take for granted. At least I do. But it's a very powerful need, and if it goes ignored, it can really affect how others view us, even how we view ourselves. Yet, if throughout the course of our regular lives we continually encounter this need to cleanse our outer selves, then it stands to reason that within us, there might be a need for cleansing as well. If my body is constantly getting dirty, what about my mind? What about my soul? In Jesus' first century Jewish world, cleansing on the deepest level, the cleansing of sin, could not be accomplished in a mikvah. That could only be carried out through a priest sacrificing an animal. And that sacrifice could only be done in one place, the temple. Through the regular sacrifice of animals, the sins of the people of Israel were believed to collect in the temple throughout the year. Finally, all of those sins would be absolved on the one very important day, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Of the thousands of priests that worked in the temple, the most important was the high priest. And the most important function of the high priest was cleansing the temple of all of Israel's sins on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It was a huge event with large crowds gathering in the temple courtyard to witness the atonement of all of their sins. By the time the high priest had finished the process, the crowd would leave feeling the immense relief of knowing all of their sins had now been forgiven. The high priest was perhaps the most revered person in the culture of Jesus' time because he was the one responsible for the monumental task of atoning for an entire nation. He carried out that vital act of inner cleansing. This was so important to the people of Israel 
because without that cleansing, they wouldn't be fit to stand before God. In the Gospels, Jesus is the most important figure as well, and He is also presented as a priest. This was so important to the Gospel writers, because according to them, Jesus did not just cleanse people, He allowed them to stand before God. There are many references throughout the Gospels of Jesus' priestly role. As an infant, the wise man brought him frankincense, an aromatic spice used in religious ceremonies. His uncle Zechariah was a priest. Jesus actually taught scripture in the temple when he was only 12. He even frequently forgave people of their sins. But perhaps the biggest allusion in the Gospels to Jesus' role as a priest is his cleansing of the temple, one of the few stories that appears in all four Gospels. This is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Its most significant structure is Kabat as Sakra, the Dome on the Rock. This Muslim shrine covers a rock that holds sacred meaning for both Muslims and Jews. Muslims believe it to be the rock from which their holy prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven in his night journey. For the Jews, it is believed to cover the rock on which Abraham nearly sacrificed his son Isaac. It is on this same holy site that the temple stood 2,000 years ago in the time of Jesus. In that time, the temple was the holiest place on earth, believed to contain the very presence of God. Because of this, it was the only true place of worship in the world for a Jew. The caretakers of this most precious symbol of Israel's identity were the priests. Thousands of priests performed various functions in the temple, from sweeping the floors to daily sacrifices all the way to the high priest carrying out the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Shockingly, the Gospels depict Jesus entering into this sacred place and wreaking havoc. In this event, frequently referred to as the cleansing of the temple, the Gospels present Jesus at his most zealous. He overturns tables, he makes a whip and drives out everyone, including animals from the temple court. In the cleansing of the temple, we see a very different kind of priest someone whose passion for God drove him to take bold steps to drive his religious group to change. In New York, it's not at all unusual to run into someone who's willing to go against the grain of convention. This city's full of people with unique backgrounds and perspectives. And that applies to its religious leaders as well. I had the chance to speak with Tony Romeo, the pastor of historic Manhattan SDA Church in Greenwich Village. And Pastor Tony has a unique background for a pastor. You know, being from advertising, it's my, my biggest background is advertising. He actually worked in advertising for 35 years, and I quickly discovered that as a pastor, he's not afraid to try different things to reach people. I, I, I'm a pretty funny guy. I love comedy. <laughs> I think comedy kept me sane. I, my eye removed at 14 years old. But when I started uh, saying, gee, how can I go out there and really make a, sort, of a, sort of a public presence? Mm -hmm. I'm a minister, should I go into a comedy club? Mm -hmm. So one night I tried it. Mm -hmm. I had some material from my Italian background. <laughs> my father came from Italy. That was his boat, that was his boat coming from Italy. <laughs> when I opened the, uh, my little, my little stand-up routine, I tap my glass eye. A little sound check first. I give him one of these, one of these. It's very real. Is everybody okay? And he did a good 10 minute set using a lot of material about his glass eye, like this bit about dropping his glass eye in the shower. You kind of look at it. You're not quite, quite sure. Am I looking at the eye? Is the eye looking at me? You don't know what's going on. You have no idea what's going on here. And you might ask, and in fact a lot of people did, what's a preacher doing at a comedy club? And why I do that is I just wanted to be touching people. I always wanted to touch people. 
He wasn't trying to upset people or be provocative in any way. He just wanted to reach out and interact with people who would never otherwise choose to walk into his church. See, I'm very naive about the, the box people want to put you in. I just think you need to go out there and meet people. There's one he just wanted to put himself out there and meet new people, to let them get a different, more accepting view of his profession, of his church, and his God. And he saw that happen the moment he walked off stage and the headlining comedian addressed the audience. But after I got off, he, he, he said to the audience, can you believe Tony Romeo is a minister of a church right here in New York City? And again, almost a standing ovation, they all applauded because they couldn't believe that a minister of a Christian church was appearing at a comedy club. These are the things we need to start doing. And that was the dominant, overriding theme of everything we talked about, acceptance of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to reach and meet new people, to show them a different picture of God, a God that loves everyone and wants to connect with them. This is the Wailing Wall. originally a retention wall for the foundation upon which the temple was built. It's of special significance for the Jews, because the wall represents the last remaining vestige of the temple. But in the time of Jesus, this stone and others like it were posted along the balustrade that separated the temple courtyard from the temple itself. These signs served as a harsh warning, reading, no foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. The priests in Jesus' time worked to make the temple, the Father's house, a place of corruption, discrimination and judgment, open only to those they viewed as spiritually clean. This did not sit well with Jesus the priest. His fiery cleansing of the temple revealed a priest driven to show that God was not about those things. He was a God of love and acceptance of all peoples. From the beginning of our talk, Pastor Tony emphasized that he believed Jesus' accepting, loving attitude toward all people would make him a perfect fit for New York. He never prejudged anybody. He was very real with people. And this is essentially important in the city, especially New York City. Because New York City is a place where you're going to meet on every single block a different personality. And in talking about how Jesus would fit into today's society, I asked if this theme we find in the Gospels of Jesus' acceptance in the face of religious intolerance is something that's still relevant today. Well, where, where do we start? <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> well, he started by emphasizing that, firstly, religious institutions shouldn't view themselves as some sort of ultra-exclusive club in which potential members need to be carefully screened for admittance. But acceptance is important because you can't have, you can't, like, I know, we're not the TSA, like at an airport, you know, people would think we're the TSA. Mm. To bring people into the church, they have to pass this, you know, right. you gotta pass this code. Right. You just bring them in, you know, right. just bring them in and let, let the Holy Spirit work with them. And that's what's so important about acceptance. It's not just the thing that gets someone in the door. It's the very thing that can change someone's life. That acceptance itself can be transformational. Can of course it? Just, it can. Yeah. just the of notion course. of someone Somebody who is loves someone loves me and no, when no one else does, right. that itself right. can be transformational exactly. for someone. And there's nothing up my sleeve. That's yeah. key. Yeah. To genuinely accept and love someone can change their life. But when the opposite happens, it can cause lasting damage. And Pastor Tony knows that feeling firsthand. He recounted a story from when he first started in the ministry. I'm there. I'm all charged up to go into the ministry. And a man comes up to him. He's a minister. Comes to me and says, well, Tony, you know, it's nice of you to want to go into the ministry, but because you have one eye, God can never use you because you're like a, a lamb that was blemished. Mm. And in the Old Testament, some kind of convoluted nonsense mm. that, it, that God couldn't use me. Now, but Tony decided, no, God does want to use me. I went into the ministry bivocationally. I was an advertiser for 30 years and then went into the ministry, you know, more, more recently, but I always, we're preaching all the time. Pastor Tony didn't let it stop him, but unfortunately, 
Being judged for a physical disability is a story as old as time. In addition to not accepting foreigners, the temple priests had a stern policy of not allowing anyone with physical disabilities to enter into the temple. To them, these people were cursed by God and had no place in His house. Jesus the priest, on the other hand, had a very different perspective. After He performed His very unorthodox cleansing of the temple, He declared that this house of God was a house of prayer for all nations. And finally, He welcomed the blind and the lame into the temple so that He could heal them. Jesus' revolution presented a paradigm shift. This priest welcomed and restored all those whom other priests deemed cursed, unworthy, and unclean. Pastor Tony feels a burden to show his community that God's house is a place where anyone is welcome, accepted, and loved. And not only that, a place where they can be built back up. So his church holds concerts, charity events, healthy cooking classes, even hosting nine different addiction help programs. We have uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, seven of those. We have Children of Alcoholics, we meet here on Thursday. And the newest group is called Dead is Anonymous. I may join them. <laughs> True acceptance provides something restorative to build people back up. It seems like a simple enough message, so I asked Pastor Tony, why don't we see this more in our religious communities? Well, let me, let me put it this way. Let me say that I think Christ's message of acceptance is uh, dynamically in opposition to the human spirit of always judging people. Religion can sometimes be judgmental because people are judgmental. But as Pastor Tony emphasized over and over, look at Jesus instead, and what you'll see is love and acceptance. Jesus' cleansing of the temple was a revolution against religious intolerance highlighting a radical acceptance of those that other priests refused to accept. But there was something else that stirred the zeal of this priest. The Father's house had become a place of corruption. If you want New York summed up in one image, this is it the Brooklyn Bridge. Connecting the boroughs of Manhattan and Brooklyn, it's to me a perfect symbol for the city. You see, four of New York's five boroughs are on an island, and what keeps the city connected are its miles and miles of tunnels, subway lines, and bridges. Back when it was built, the Brooklyn Bridge was a marvel of engineering, the first steel wire suspension bridge ever built by far the longest suspension bridge ever built. And looking at those towers, they're still pretty amazing. When construction was completed in 1883, Brooklyn was its own separate city, and the only way to make it from one city to the other was to cross the East River on a boat. But the Brooklyn Bridge was specifically designed for people to be able to walk on it, above the traffic. Now, any poor kid from Brooklyn who had stared across the river in amazement at the grand, imposing, inaccessible city of New York could simply put on her shoes and walk there. That short, roughly one-mile walk was a journey to another world. What had been distant was now near. What was once impossible was now right there. In the time of Jesus, priests were viewed as bridges to God. The Romans actually believed this as well. As Tiberius Caesar, the Caesar, when Jesus cleansed the temple, actually bore the title Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the empire. Interestingly, that Latin word used for priest, Pontifex, literally means bridge builder. The people of Jesus' world, who wished to have access to God, were presented with several bridges to get there. All of them were men of immense power, influence, and wealth, including the most powerful men in the world. On the other side of the bridge, in Brooklyn, I got to hang out with Michael Edwards. He's the president of a group called the Seventh Scroll, and I gotta say, they're doing something pretty unique to try and bridge people to God. And as Michael told me, 
To do that in Brooklyn, you have to try something different. People in New York City, uh, a lot of people in New York City have been scarred from religion and, or religious institutions. And a lot of people aren't too receptive to hear about God per se, especially if you were to just stick a Bible in front of them. So Michael was struck with an idea. He felt God calling him to try something different. And I was really scared, didn't know what to expect, but um, I trusted God and I just wanted to move forward with him. So he started up the seventh scroll and they've developed some programs to try and show people God in a different context. And just really allow people to see the goodness of God uh, through our charitable services. So we have a free uh, bus service, we have um, clothes and food distribution, um, and we also have a Bible study, uh, like a lifestyle education, so to speak, a program. And um, we're working on a free daycare. And that theme of free sums up what the Seven Scroll offers, including their bus which follows bus routes around Brooklyn offering free rides. And even though Mike is the group's president, he also drives the bus. And when he pulls up to a bus stop, people's initial reaction is usually very skeptical. For the first time, people are really nervous, yeah. right? So you get people tiptoeing on the bus, um, and then they're kind of looking around to see, is this a setup? Am I being punked? Um, <laughs> but uh, after they sit down and they kind of get the vibe and they, they meet Joe or whoever other volunteers are with us for the day, um, they kind of relax, they hear what we're about, and then they see, oh, we're handing out free food, and free clothes, then people relax even more. It might be hard for people to accept initially, but there really are no strings attached. It is literally a free ride. There are no requirements, and we get a wide range of people um, from all ethnic backgrounds. Uh, people just come onto the bus, they're just happy to get a free ride. Um, a lot of people tell us, you know, in this day and age, to get something for free when there's no, um, nothing in return, uh, is, is hard to find. And people try to wrap their minds around it, and it just, for a long time, just stunned. So you see a lot of blank stares on the bus, but um, by the time they leave, it's just all smiles. And in addition to providing a nice, free ride for people, Mike's seen how the bus can really help someone in a desperate situation. Was, uh, a gentleman who was shivering in the snow. Uh, we had a, a huge downpour of snow last winter and uh, the gentleman was shivering in the snow. He'd been waiting on the bus for over two hours, and the bus just, buses weren't running. And we happened to come along. So you this, were running in the snow I was no running. one else was? When no one else was running, we were running. And um, we actually pulled up to the bus stop. He was shivering, and he said he almost went home, but something told him to stay. And it just so happened that he didn't have any money to get home. So he was praying to God, how was he gonna get home? We come along with this free bus, he gets on, and we're giving away free bread. And he was just like, man, you know, God definitely sent you for me. Yeah. And that was just a blessing to hear that. Mike's seen firsthand how this bus is literally a vehicle that God uses to help people. The Seventh Scroll also offers Bible studies for people who might want to develop that relationship further. And because of their experience on the bus, many people have been interested. And uh, we've seen a, a great flux. We started at about five people in our Bible study, and now every Friday we get upwards of 60, 65 people. So we're growing steadily, and we're just thanking God for what he's done. This bus allows Mike and his team to offer the people of Brooklyn something truly free that can get them where they need to go. It provides a space for them to interact with their community and maybe foster a relationship. And we're hoping and we're praying that that relationship that we have fostered with them they can foster that with God. That's what this bus is for them. A different way to provide a bridge to God. And it's free. In Jesus' world, the temple was the only place where someone could connect to God. And the corrupt temple priests did everything they could to make a profit from this. In order to atone for their sins, pilgrims would have to approach a table in the temple courtyard to purchase a specific type of sacrificial animal sold only by the priests who also charged them an exchange rate fee doubling their profits. It was these same tables that Jesus overturned in anger. The most powerful of all of these priests, Caiaphas, the high priest, would have lived in the neighboring Herod's quarter, the most opulent area in Jerusalem. And given that both areas were elevated, many scholars believe that there would have been a bridge connecting the two. This would have allowed the high priest to bypass the people completely walking above them on his way to the temple. 
For the people in Jerusalem, this bridge would have been a symbol of the superiority of Caiaphas and his priests, elevating them above the common people, allowing these rich priests to maintain their ritual purity. Jesus, on the other hand, would have walked in the shadow of this bridge, alone with the regular people on his way to the temple. Jesus the priest walked, ate, and lived with those the temple priests shunned and exploited. In John's Gospel, after Jesus cleansed the temple, he makes a staggering claim that these priests were not the true bridge to God. It was not Caesar. It was not even the temple itself. It was he. This would have been utter blasphemy to the priests who heard it. A few days after Jesus cleansed the temple, the Gospels depict a showdown between these two types of priests. Caiaphas, the high priest, puts Jesus on trial. Both sides claim to be bridges to God. Now, one was sentencing the other to be executed. In the Gospels, we find two different types of bridges to God. On one side, we have a group that's self-important, separated, elevated, wealthy at the expense of others. If that's the bridge to God, then that's a God I want no part of. But if this guy, Jesus, the priest who walked among the people, who promoted a God for everyone, who healed and restored those no one else would touch, if he's a bridge to God, then that's a God I want to connect with.